everyone. Yes, you, you are the, the few, the brave. Mike. You got me, Andy. Check the receiver, Andy. Check, 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 check. So, here we are, and, uh, and sometimes, professionals. Yes, <laughs> real pros up here, but it's great to see the brave, the few, the brave that came out on this chilly morning this morning, so glad you're all here today, and hello to all of you in video land too, who maybe were a little smarter than us and stayed home <laughs> in this frigid morning, but hey, we're Northwest Iowans, and you, you gotta just get out there and take it on, because uh, that's where we live, days like this remind you of uh, how much you appreciate summer. So let's put our thoughts there, but also put our thoughts and our spirits around the warmth of being with God's people. We've got a beautiful place to be in, protected from the elements in here, and the awesome, beautiful, wonderful opportunity to worship our God and reflect on his love. So that's what we're here to do today. We're glad you're all here, glad you're all joining us out in video land as well. Uh, just wanna share a couple of things before we begin. Uh, first of all, I hope you all received uh, the Lenten devotional that Jody and I wanted to give to the members of Bethel for this Lenten season. Lent starts this coming Wednesday, and that is Ash Wednesday, first day of Lent, the 40 days of Lent, and uh, that's when the devotionals in this booklet begin. There's a devotional for each and every day of Lent. It's based around uh, just quotes from the, the wonderful Christian uh, author, teacher, um, Henry Nowen, who has blessed so many lives. He's written a lot of material, just reflective, contemplative kinds of things about the, the, the spiritual life, the Christian life. And there's quotes by him that the devotionals are kind of, uh, uh, they're kind of the springboard for the devotionals as well as scripture texts for each day. And then just some thoughts to reflect on each day. We wanna invite all of you in Bethel to take part in going through this devotional with us throughout the Lenten season and letting God's spirit work in all of us just the way that he wants to, uh, which can be a variety of different ways. But that's gonna be our focus during Lent that we invite you to join in. The first couple of devotionals are really short and brief and you're gonna go, what? I mean, that's all? And it is just very short, very brief. But then I think on, uh, on Friday um, is when the, it picks up into the full devotional. So Wednesday and Thursday, you're gonna seem like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but hang in there, and, uh, and then on Friday, there's a fuller kind of devotional that uh, develops. And my messages are going to kind of pick up on some themes in the devotional, too, as we go along. And, uh, and hopefully it'll be a real blessing. If you would like a, an, an additional copy or you didn't get a copy, we do have a few extra ones that are on the table in the comments for you to grab and take home. And then uh, you can get in touch with us, and maybe we can get some more if anybody needs any more of these yeah i'm thinking i'm thinking of those for people who may not be on the regular church mailing list but they attend and so they didn't get one in the mail that's that's who those are for did y'all hear that All right. All right. good and i am so glad that uh, Corey, Julie, Colton, and Jarrett Rose are with Whoa. us this morning because Jarrett Rose qualified for the state wrestling tournament. Congratulations, Jarrett. We are so happy for you and wish you all the best. God's blessings as you continue to use your gifts to glorify Him and, and just, what a just do your best. I mean, a year ago, he was yeah, seriously I was, injured. I was with him in the emergency room and we were like, what's going on and with a, an injury to his spinal cord and, and just wondering what was going to happen and, and God just has been so gracious and good in blessing Jared with healing and amazing gifts and a spirit I mean Jared's spirit uh, the work hard spirit the commitment 
That's what makes a, a true wrestler. So we're so happy for you, Jared. So proud of you and God bless you and happy for your whole family. All right, enough of me. We're ready to sing and worship our great God. Let's lift up his name and praise the great God that we belong to.
who is over all and through all and in all. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do, Do nothing, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus.
prayer that you will make us a servant, that you will make us into people who follow the example of Jesus, who emptied himself, gave up all the glory of heaven, all the splendor, all the, the power. He gave it all up to become a servant, to save us. He came, he became one of us, emptied himself, the Apostle Paul says, and became obedient even unto death, even death on a cross. An incredible example of, of becoming a servant, one who gives of himself for the sake of others. And you call us into, into that kind of life. You call us into being servants as well, to humble ourselves to look to the needs of others, to consider others better than ourselves. That's hard for us to do as human beings, Father. And we need your help. We, that is why we pray this prayer, to make us, make me a servant. Help us to look to those needs that are around us. Our world is full of them right now, full of people that need your love. And we have the great privilege of knowing that love. We have the great privilege of being blessed by that love, being filled by that love. Father, you have poured your love into us by the power of your spirit. Help us to, to understand and grasp that. The Apostle Paul also prays that we may have power to know the love of Christ in our hearts, how wide it is, how, how high it is, how long it is, how deep it is, so that we can and share that love with others so that we can be so filled up with and have our need for love met that we can we can look to the, to the needs of others and love them with the love that we have experienced from you do that work in our hearts father so we can be your agents of love in our world we ask that our time now as we spend time together as your people that, that you will fill us and that you will encourage us that you will bless us, that you will remind us of your great love for us, and how, and how you have poured that out on us so that we can go into our world equipped to share. Father, we pray that you will fill Bethel Church with your love. And as we uh, reflected on earlier with the, with the reading, that you will unite us in your love, that your spirit will be at work among us, drawing us together to be the body of Christ here in this place this community of Sheldon, this time in history. Use us as we, as you bring us together. Use us for your purposes. And may what is experienced here, the love that comes from you, may bring glory to your name. May people see it and, and know, as Jesus said, that by this you, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So do that work in us. We need your help with that, Father. We need the power of your spirit, and we ask for that. Do your work in our church to fill us with that love for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, in love, we pray for our sister, Belva. We thank you so much for how well things have been going for her, and we pray for your, for your touch in her body, your complete healing of her. Continue to pray against the cancer. Even though it's, it's kind of stable right now, we want to pray it right out of her body. And we ask, Father, by the power of your spirit and the blood of Jesus, that you will heal her. And we ask that you will uh, fill her with your spirit and, and direct her right now. As in times like this, you, know, you kind of um, you take time to reflect and you reflect on what does God have for me? How does he want to use me? And I pray that we pray together that you will uh, reveal that to Belva, that you'll reveal that to all of us purpose for us and how you want to use us wherever we are and whatever our life circumstances. We pray for our dear brother Jay and for his family as they continue to feel the sadness of the loss of Katie. We pray, Father, that you will comfort and strengthen and bless and encourage and uphold this dear brother and, and his family as they walk through this time of loss. We pray that you'll sustain all of us, Father, as we navigate these strange times. Pray that you'll provide for needs and show us the way how you want to, how we need to follow you in obedience and decisions we need to make. All of that, we pray over the leadership of Bethel. We pray over each of our lives that you'll guide and direct by your spirit. 
Father, we pray for our nation. We pray that your spirit will be at work in our nation, in our leaders. We ask that you'll give them a, a spirits that are attuned to your spirit, that seek you out. For that is where true wisdom lies, Father. And we pray that, that as you say in your word, you direct the hearts and minds of kings and of rulers, direct the hearts and minds of our leaders, Father. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus that you will be at work gracious to our land and gracious to our world as we continue to navigate this pandemic. Deliver us from it, Father, we pray. We pray that, uh, that your will will be done. Thank you that we can rely on you as the God who is in control, our sovereign God who loves us and has a plan that will be fulfilled for your glory. And we look forward to that day when Jesus comes again, our great King, our Savior, the one who loved us so much. We pray this all in his name. Amen. So this morning we're, we're doing some thinking about the love of God. And there's this beautiful, this beautiful hymn that's been around for, for ages, the love of God. I love this hymn. We're going to sing this right now. And the, the last verse is, is my favorite about this great imagery of, of we're, the, we're, the, we're the skies of parchment, we're the oceans full of ink, and every stalk on earth a quill. You couldn't, you couldn't even begin to capture the love of God if you used all of that, that ink, that space, and wrote as much as you could. It still wouldn't capture how huge and awesome the love of God is for us. Let's stand and sing this great hymn.
Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your great love. We pray that by the power of your spirit, now as we turn to your word, that you will direct our hearts, our minds, to understand and know more about your love as we see it in Jesus. Um, he came to show us who you are. He came to, he was, he, in him was all your glory. And, uh, and in him, that is revealed to us. So give us a deeper understanding of him a grasp of how great your love for us is as we look into your word. We thank you for your word, Father. We thank you for giving it to us, for revealing yourself to us in it, for guiding our lives, for helping us to see and understand who we are, all that you've done for us, and your purposes for our lives. And we pray that you will be at work in our hearts right now by the power of your spirit as we, do, as we hear the word, as we read the word, as the word is spoken. May your spirit empower all of it today. Father, we give this time to you in the powerful and awesome name of Jesus. Amen. Today we're going to be looking together at the story that is part of Bethel's Dwell at Home Faith Formation Curriculum for this week. Earlier this week, I hope you all received the email with the Dwell at Home materials that Jody Seabrick puts together each week and sends out to our Dwell at Home families. She compiles the, the materials and sends these out every week. We wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of that, of what a typical week's lesson is like with the Dwell at Home experience. That's why we sent it to the whole congregation this week. And throughout this year, the lessons have been looking at stories from the life of Jesus. And each week, a story symbol is included with every lesson. You've been seeing them up on the screens here each week. Those are the story symbols for each week of the Dwell at Home Faith Formation Curriculum. And they serve to remind people of the story and enable them to quickly recall what it was about. They're meant to be used with children, but actually it's kind of a nice tool for adults to like, oh yeah, that's that story about the life of Jesus. So this is a story symbol for this week. It's a picture of a man in a tree, which should make us all think quite quickly of a particular story and a person from the life of Jesus. Who was it that climbed up in a tree? Donnie? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Yes, Zacchaeus. That's what this week's story is about, the story of Zacchaeus. It's found in Luke chapter 19, and we're going to read it together. Luke chapter 19, right at the beginning of the chapter, the first 10 verses have the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. So if you're anything like me, you can't help but have the Zacchaeus song run through your head when you read that story. So let's just go ahead and sing it together right now. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. That's just fun. <laughs> so that song and that story always give me the impression that Zacchaeus was kind of a harmless, likable little guy. 
you can get the picture in your mind of this vertically challenged man who was just trying to uh, work around his shortcomings. Oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the courtesy laugh. So that he can see Jesus just like everybody else. You get a good impression of him because he wants to see Jesus. And he figures out a pretty creative way to do it. How can you not like a guy who wants to see Jesus that badly and who really makes the effort to make it happen? you got to like a guy like that. But I will guarantee you that if you were one of the Jewish people in Jericho that day who knew anything about Zacchaeus, you would not have had a favorable impression of him. We get a clue about how people must have felt about Zacchaeus from, the very, from a very telling line in the text. In verse 7, right after Jesus tells Zacchaeus to come down because he plans to stay at his house that day, Luke tells us that all the people saw this and began to mutter. He is gone to be the guest of a sinner. They didn't like this at all. They weren't happy for the wee little man. They, it made them mutter. They were mad, and this wasn't right. This wasn't cool. What was Jesus thinking? Didn't he know? Know what? Didn't he know what they all knew about Zacchaeus? What was it that they all knew about Zacchaeus? What they knew was that he wasn't anything like the cute and harmless wee little man in the Zacchaeus song. So what was he like? Luke says in verse 2 that he was a chief tax collector. This is the only place in the New Testament where we see this particular designation. There are other places where we encounter tax collectors, but Zacchaeus is the only person who is called a chief tax collector. This meant that he was a tax collector who was in charge of all the other tax collectors in a particular district. He probably oversaw all the tax collectors in Jericho and maybe even in the surrounding area. And that didn't mean that he was a respected government official with high standing in the community. No, a better comparison would be that he was like a mob boss or a drug kingpin. We could say that he was the kingpin of the Jericho tax cartel. Tax collection in the Roman Empire and in, in areas like Palestine was an extremely corrupt enterprise. Tax collectors could do pretty much what they pleased as long as they delivered the revenues that Rome expected. They could overcharge, they could extort with virtual impunity, and they almost always did. It was an incredibly lucrative field to be in. Tax collection and tax collectors would probably be a little bit like what you see in, the mo in movies or, or TV shows about organized crime or gangsters. These tax collectors were the nasty guys who could intimidate helpless citizens or business owners with threats and harassment to make them pay whatever they demanded. And Zacchaeus was like the, the godfather of it all. He was the boss. He was the chief tax collector. And it made him very wealthy. Luke, Luke says he was wealthy. It was very lucrative. And if you really think about it, Zacchaeus must have been nothing like a likable little guy. He was anything but to acquire this kind of power and this kind of authority, he must have been a pretty nasty, conniving, ruthless kind of a person. And on top of that, he was actually a person who was willing to do this to his own people. Zacchaeus was a Jew. He was one of them. He wasn't someone from the outside, someone from Rome who was sent in, someone that the empire appointed, fulfilling an assignment, and he shows up and he's an outsider. He was, a, he was one of them. He was a Jew who was willing to act on behalf of the government that was oppressing the Jewish people, his own people. He was taking money from his own people to give to Rome, and he was also extorting extra money from his own people to line his own pockets. 
So one of the things we do in the Dwell at Home lessons is we stop and we ask wondering questions. Wondering questions. We wonder. And a good wondering question right now would be, I wonder what kind of feelings the people of Jericho had towards the keys. I wonder. Probably angry, bitter, resentful, hated him, despised him, all of those feelings of revulsion. Or another wondering question. I wonder what the people of Jericho would say about Zacchaeus. What would they call him? Cheat. Scumball. Liar. Sneeze. Traitor. I think of all kinds of things that they call him. Or maybe this question. I wonder how people acted around Zacchaeus. Stink eye? Did they give him the dirty looks behind his back? Stay away from him? Turn their backs on him? Didn't want to associate with him? You can probably imagine all kinds of things and answers to those wondering questions. You just get the picture in your mind about what it was like for the people with Zacchaeus and what it was like for Zacchaeus around the people. People like Zacchaeus were despised by their fellow Jews. People like Zacchaeus were actually called sinners. And that doesn't mean the same as it does when we say that we're all sinners. I mean, we sit there and say, yeah, we're, we, we are all sinners. No, it had a special designation with the Jewish people. The Jewish people, sinners, were a group of people that they all looked down on. Because they so flagrantly disregarded the Jewish laws and, and they lived such immoral lives. Prostitutes, criminals, adulterers, liars, cheats, murderers, drunkards, and the like. They were all labeled as sinners. They were not even considered to be one of the Jewish people anymore because of their lifestyle and their behavior. They were looked down upon. They were excluded by the people. No decent, self-respecting Jew would have anything to do with them. They stayed away from them. And that's how people viewed tax collectors, too, especially chief tax collectors like Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus actually really deserved to be viewed like that. I mean, because of his greed and his desire for power, Zacchaeus made a conscious choice to be the way he was. He was willing to, to throw away any sense of morality, any desire to do what was honest and right, any desire to treat others the way that he would want to be treated. He was willing to mistreat his own people. And it's no wonder that people despised him, considered him a sinner. Zacchaeus was actually probably the last person anybody in Jericho wanted to be around. And that's what's so astounding about this story. Because Jesus chooses to recognize Zacchaeus. He looks him in the tree and calls him by name. Another great wondering question would be, I wonder what Zacchaeus thought when Jesus did that. I wonder what he thought. I wonder what he felt. How did he know I was here? How did he know my name? <laughs> Zacchaeus must have been shocked. And he, was, he was probably embarrassed. Here I am up in this tree. But I'm sure that he hated the fact that all these people that he mistreated and suddenly knew that he was up there. And they're all looking at him and pointing at him. He must have felt their immediate reactions of anger and hate when they saw him. Oh, Zacchaeus, what's he doing up there? What, why is Jesus talking to him? You talk about feeling cornered with nowhere to hide. Zacchaeus must have wished he could be one of the birds in the tree with him that could just fly away right away and get out of there. But he couldn't get away. Jesus was looking right at him and he called him by name. He didn't look up there, hey, shorty, what you doing up there? What you going on? 
What do you know why he up in that tree? He didn't, he didn't do anything like that. No, he called him by name. He somehow knew his name. And he must have called out his name in a friendly way. You know, in our Zacchaeus song, we've got Jesus, Zacchaeus, you count down like a mom or a dad. You know, you get down from there. And this is the way Jesus must have called out his name. It had to be a friendly greeting. There must have been friendliness in the way Jesus said his name and told him to come down because Zacchaeus came down gladly. Jesus didn't say his name the way other people said his name. With all that scorn and anger and resentment. That's how Zacchaeus usually heard his name. He said, Zacchaeus. Duh, there's Zacchaeus. That. Zacchaeus. All of that is how he usually heard his name. But Jesus said his name differently. Zacchaeus. He was glad to see him. Zacchaeus responded gladly. Jesus greeted him with a, a greeting of someone who liked him. This was a greeting of a friend. It was a greeting of someone who wanted to be with him. Jesus, Jesus wasn't demanding or ordering Zacchaeus to come down so that he could chew him out and let him know what a creep he was. He was inviting him to come down because he wanted to come to Zacchaeus' house and actually spend time with him. He said, I must stay at your house today. In Jewish culture, this was a huge compliment. Wanting to come to someone's house communicated acceptance and friendship. It was a great honor. So I wonder how that made Zacchaeus feel. Shocked? Nobody ever wanted to come to his house. People stayed away from him. They avoided him. Was he surprised? Was he delighted? Was he suspicious? I, I would guess that he was feeling a whole range of emotions. But we don't need to wonder about how the people felt about this. Luke says they were muttering. We talked about this already. We, they were muttering because Jesus was going to the house of a sinner. They were appalled. They were disgusted. They were mad. This wasn't done, especially by a respected Jewish teacher. Respected Jewish teachers like Jesus rejected sinners like Zacchaeus. And by going to his house, Jesus was saying he accepted Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, the sinner. Not only that he accepted Zacchaeus, but he wanted to be with Zacchaeus. It wasn't like Zacchaeus came to Jesus begging him to come to his house. He said, oh, Jesus, Jesus, come to my house today. Would you please come to my house? Just come. And Jesus, you know, rolled his eyes. Oh, all right, fine. I'll come for a little while. It wasn't like Jesus said, reacted that way at all. And it wasn't like Jesus had all kinds of other people's houses that he would have rather have gone to like, oh, okay, Zacchaeus, I'll come to your... No, he wanted to go to Zacchaeus' house. He made the choice. He took the initiative. Zacchaeus didn't need to beg. He didn't have to overcome any resistance at all on Jesus' part. He didn't have to somehow get past the revulsion and disgust that he experienced from so many people. There was none of that with Jesus. This was all Jesus' idea. Instead of keeping Zacchaeus at arm's length or pushing him away, Jesus moved towards Zacchaeus with his arms wide open. He wanted to do this. And this tells us so much about the heart of Jesus. We see the heart of Jesus in this. Sinners like Zacchaeus. Jesus moves toward them. This is how he feels towards sinners like Zacchaeus. Sinners like, like you and me. He moves toward sinners. He wants to be with sinners. He doesn't push them away. He doesn't avoid them. He loves them. Jesus loves sinners. He says that's why he came. He came to seek and save the lost. The 
heart of Jesus loves sinners. It's passion for sinners. When I wonder how all of this must have made Zacchaeus feel, I can't help but think that what Zacchaeus felt most of all was love. He felt love. Jesus loved him. Jesus knew his name. Jesus wanted to be with him. He didn't write him off because of his past or his reputation or what others said about him. He loved Zacchaeus, the despised, rejected, hated sinner. And Jesus' love transformed Zacchaeus. His love turned Zacchaeus into a new man. The greedy, cold-hearted, thieving extortionist became the generous, loving, giving philanthropist. All because Jesus forgave him and accepted him. All because Jesus loved him. Just like he loves you and me. He knows your name. He knows my name. He doesn't keep us at arm's length like, okay. He doesn't treat us like, okay, I'll tolerate you. No, he doesn't push us away. He wants to be with us. And when we receive him by faith, he forgives us. He accepts us. He loves us. And his love changes us, just like it changed Zacchaeus. His love changes us so that we can show his love to others. People in our world desperately need us to show the love of Jesus. There are so many people in our world, especially now, who feel isolated who feel alone, who feel rejected, who feel unworthy, who feel unloved. So here's a, a wondering question. I wonder how they would feel if I showed them the love of Jesus. I wonder how they would feel. What if I treated them like, like Jesus treated Zacchaeus? What if I wanted to know their name? And remember, call them by name. That communicates so much to a person. When you call them by name, when you care to know their name. What if I cared to know their name, remembered it, called them by name? What if I, what if I cared to know something about their life? Where they live? Go to your house, Zacchaeus. What if I cared to know about their life, where they live? what they do, what they like. What if I spent time with them? I spent time with them. What if, what if I saw all that they could be as a deeply loved child of God? That's what Jesus invites us to do, to follow his example. Let's look at this video that just challenges us this way. But what if we could love the way Jesus did? Passionately, faithfully, powerfully. What if the way we love could make a difference in the world around us? What if that love looked at everyone the way God does? A love which doesn't see the past, but is consumed by a desire to see people come to know Jesus. A love which is patient and kind, not envious or prideful. A love which puts others before ourselves, chooses peace over anger. A love which protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Do we love like this? Do we love like Jesus? Maybe it's time to ask a simple question. How can we love better?
Jesus, help us to love like you. Help us to love better. We offer ourselves to you. Thank you for loving us. Use us to love others. Help us to see them with your eyes. Help us to, to be what you call us to be, to love like you do, like you love us. We are so grateful to belong to you. We are so grateful to have the security of knowing your love. And the power of your spirit reveal that to us more and more. So that in that security, knowing that we belong to a loving, good, caring, faithful Father, that out of that security and that, that reassurance, that love, we can love others. We need your help with that. We give ourselves to you and ask for that. And we give you our, our praise as our wonderful, loving, good Savior, Father, friend. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
role as the church. I also want to uh, invite you to share your tithes and your offerings. Uh, there's an opportunity to do that as you leave the auditorium today. There are offering plates sitting on chairs right outside the doors. We continue to just be amazed at the way God provides through the generosity of his people uh, for the needs of, the, of Bethel and its ministry. And so thank you to all of you that continue to be so faithful and supporting through your tithes and your offerings. There's people receiving them at the door, but you can also can send them into the church office, drop them by at Bethel North, or use the online giving app called Tithely. You can access that through our website or, or with the app itself. Thank you for your continued uh, gracious, generous giving uh, to the ministry of Bethel. So as you leave today, know that the living Christ goes with you. He goes before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, alongside of you to befriend you. He's above you to watch over you, and he is inside you. Familiar with his power and his peace. Amen.